you know, so like we live and die by Huni. And like even though we made so many mistakes, we still made it to five games. So I feel like this time we'll have an even bigger advantage because like I'm pretty sure C9 is scared right now because they know we won't make the same mistakes we did last time. I hate me though. Oh, a lot of Welcome back, League fans. <laughs> I too hate makeup. I'm gonna... <laughs> Swipe it off. But Adrian, we actually saw exactly what he was talking about there in that that you play to Huni, the game could go awry. But if Huni mm -hmm. does bad in general, the game could go awry, and that's actually what we saw. Yeah, and you also have to wonder. They say, "Oh, we're not just going to play to Huni." But when has Immortals found much success playing yeah. to other lanes? We did see them get double summer spells bottom, get priority there, and then it didn't really translate to much else. Yeah, and it seems as though Cloud Nine. You think back to the semifinal series, the four games first, the first four they played to Huni. The last game they picked the Lissandra top and tried to play towards the bottom side. Cloud Nine mm. saw it coming because they're just so smart at figuring out what the enemy team wants to do right off the bat. Yeah, I think also Adrian should. I personally would love to see him go back to his more supportive picks and have yeah. a follow-up on the things that Huni and Rainover are doing. It doesn't seem like that's exactly what they're going to do, but based on the first game, Cloud9 looked super good, so yeah. I feel like that requires a pretty decent departure for Immortals strategically. Yeah, and Adrian said he thinks they're scared right now. Well, I don't think Cloud9 are scared at all. 20-minute Baron, no. they ending the game at 32 minutes after just taking an inhibitor turret in a fight immediately no fear at all yeah i don't know if scared would be the word seeing how kind of broken cloud nine was after their last loss to immortals the fact that they were kind of like hey we need to kind of make this work for us and this is one thing that i like about cloud nine and the pick and ban phase even when they have a decisive victory yeah. they still change their pick and ban strategy Remember, they gave Vladimir to Immortals in their second round of picks on the blue side. So that not only did they not force Immortals to first pick it, they kind of gave it to them later. Now they just ban Vladimir to change the landscape and make Dylan Falco adapt on the fly. Yeah, they also yeah. don't want it as a bit of a counter pick because then you have to blind pick Cassiopeia, where you may want to be blind picking something a little bit safer than that because you know that Bo Belter has some counters up his sleeve. What will be the final two bans? Cloud9 always taking their time they get the one they want and it is going to be Sivir, something we do see Sneaky playing as well but they want to keep it out of the hands of Wild Turtle so we'll see that Ash and Jin once again most likely. Impact gets his Gnar, <laughs> no questions asked. So pick up for Cloud9. For Immortals here, I think you have to take Tom Kench or you risk giving it over to Cloud9. Uh, mm -hmm. It went through the pick and ban phase, the Trundle was the other ban yep. that ended up going down so that might have been a support ban to make sure that they can get themselves to Tom Kench. Not a good counter. That's exactly it. Tom Kench and Jin, the start of some good synergy there for Immortals. Yeah, and I like that they take the Jin over the Ash, because now Cloud9, if they go for the Ash, you have a, you have a counter safety. in the Tom Kench. Like, there's good synergy between Tom Kench and Ash, and it's a really good combination, but they're trying to kind of bait the low mobility of the Ash and make sure that they have something to kind of counterplay it with. They're both very similar, but I still think that, oh, Wild Turtle, a little bit more comfortable on that Jin. Yeah, if you're just thinking through the rest of Cloud9's composition as well, I wonder if they want to actually change that much. Uh, they're hovering the Gragas. They still have the potential to go Zac if they really want to, because last game he technically picked it over the other champions as well. Oh, wow. Ooh. Karma was left up. That Rek'Sai got put on the ban list. That is really surprising to me. Yep. And it's probably going to go to Smoothie, even though he has played it very little, and it's been Cloud9's most banned champion throughout the playoffs. So they're... They're, I think, mainly doing this to deny it from Immortals and make sure that Poe Belter or Adrian can't do it from a more supportive style. It will make Cloud9's composition play much differently, though. Yeah, that might be a smoothie support, but Braum is still up. Yeah. Usually you would think he would go with that for the high Ooh. CC, mm -hmm. but yeah, they saw the Tom Kench come through. They may be thinking this is a lane we have to poke out and get an advantage there. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. We also get to see the Nidalee from Rainover really going to have to try and out farm Meteos because that's a matchup where the Nidalee can get 20 to 30 CS up and really start taking over the jungle, even more so than a Rek'Sai would be able to. Yeah, Rek'Sai can kind of keep in tow in terms of farm speeds, whereas in Nidalee, mm -hmm. you can usually see up two levels sometimes around like 9 and 11. If the Nidalee just starts invading the jungle, has so many ways to get away. I feel like that's what's going to have to happen. Immortals, yeah. again, drafting a composition with hardly any crowd control. Yep. And this is going to be a team that runs away, Cloud9. Before they locked in the Karma, I was expecting something like a Cassiopeia, Ooh. an Ash, and a Braum, but they completely changed their style. Right. This, to me, says extremely strong leads, and that's the majority of what they care about. 
the Lucian Karma crushes yeah. the Syndra, exactly. one of Jensen's strongest laners. So instead of going with the great hyperscaling team fight they had last game, they just want to win lanes now. Hit it. Yeah, it's hard to predict the style that Cloud9 is going to come out with in that next game. They all have incredibly deep champion pools, and they always play the top things. The Syndra for Jensen, this is going to be a big problem because we have seen some things played into it, like the Talia, but it, it hasn't really been a good counter yet. And this puts even more wow. pressure on Rainover to perform. Because if you can take over the jungle yep. of Cloud9, you can neutralize or punish Cloud9's strong lanes with ganks. Because the way C9 wins is to push up those lanes and get a large advantage early. But Rainover, and almost Rainover alone, is the one that has to stop that. Immortals, full on poke comp. Yes. This is very much a, a composition that needs to win before 40 minutes. Right. And C9's gone with strong lanes. So there's a lot of pressure on Rainover this game. Exactly. And if you start getting behind as a poke composition in the laning phase, it's very hard to execute on that pattern. And yeah. Cloud9 just played against this type of poke composition with a Varus and an Italy yesterday. Right, exactly. We saw Ninja bringing that to the table. It's going to be a crazy one here coming into game two. We always wonder what will come out of picks and bans. And it seems like Immortals have to switch it up for this one or have chosen to switch it up, I should say, as they lock in for game two. We're about to head onto the rift as Dylan Falco and Coach Reapert head to the backstage as they have given their players the last word of confidence as they head into game. It's going to be an amazing one. Game two here versus Cloud9 and Immortals. As we head onto the rift, as always, head over to Twitter, hashtag C9win, hashtag IMTWin, tally up those votes, give support to your teams as well in-house here. They want to hear it, and we're going to see what they can do going into game two. The bands switched it up a bit to allow that karma through, to allow a bit of a composition switch for Cloud9, and now the poke comp coming through for Immortals, kind of putting that ticker on the early game. See what they can do now as we are on to the rift for game two. And because of this composition and the structure of it for Immortals, I'm watching Wild Turtle this game, because if he can land his Ws, his Deadly Flourishes, that will allow Poke to land guaranteed from Poe Belter as a follow-up. And that's the siege pattern that they're looking for, is long range, get a little bit of a poke down, make sure that you have the follow-up, because he's really their primary CC here. And I'm also just going to talk every game about how amazing this series is. Please do. <laughs> um, Immortals was 33 and three combined in the spring and summer split. Yeah. And it was almost an afterthought of like, oh, I wonder how Immortals is going to do at Worlds. I can't wait to see them yeah. internationally. And the fact that they may not even get that opportunity is insane to me. It is because you go into each season and you think, oh yeah, Immortals will probably almost go undefeated again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But will that happen at the end of the season? No, I don't think so. They have been more dominant in the regular season yeah. than Cloud9 was when Cloud9 exploded on the scene. And the thing is, Cloud9 carried that through to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. That's where Immortals has completely faltered in the actual high-pressure games. Then you also look at Cloud9, and they've made it to every world championship yeah. since the yep. formation of their organization. That's the world we live in. One of those teams doesn't get to go to Worlds. You're breaking my heart, Jeff. <laughs> I know. It's going to be a sad day for someone, but a happy day for the other ones. Yeah. Such is sports. That's, that, that is true. Right, we'll go to the best team here that represents today. Right now, Cloud9 has shown strength in the beginning, but as I mentioned, in the closing of Game 1, Immortals could have the same effect on Game 2. We could see a 30-minute game in their favor, just as easy as Cloud9 won Game 1, and that's what makes this series so amazing. Turtle and Daydrian coming to lane, but they're going to have that level 2. So they may just uh, be able to gain back the aggression. It doesn't look like they oh, no, did they, the Yeah, you're right. I looked down as well as you said that. So they didn't even get it. Zyrene's going to go back and check what happened because that is an awful start to the lane for yes. Adrian and Wild Turtle. And that's going to put a very early advantage for Sneaky and Smoothie, who will basically have this shove. The next time I feel like Immortals would be able to retaliate would be level three. So it's going to be a while of Sneaky and Smoothie being able to be shoved up. Yeah, it was warded, and then they had the Karma invade the very ranged support that allows the poke. So they had to stop the Gromp. So neither side ended up doing a camp level one, but Immortals came a little bit chunked to the lane and had to give up pressure. So good eyes, Cloud9 trying to kind of formulate something in the early game to get under the skin of Immortal's bot lane here. So a little bit of aggression only with the attendance of Rainover and Meteos really last game to the bot side. It was all really mid lane, but what happened around the mid lane and how they rotate. Yeah, and also notice the ward that Sneaky was able to get deep mm -hmm. in the jungle of Immortal. So when Rainover goes over the blue side, it alerts C9 to be a little bit more careful with the potential mid gank. And actually, Here comes it's going to allow Meteos to invade. Rainover's spite of the early. Ooh, Meteos stole it. 
a Gragas invading a Nidalee. That is how you see it's a team effort when you jungle. The Nidalee yeah. can't do it by herself all the time. That ward came down. Medios is putting pressure on Rainover because he knows he's not performing right now. And what is going to happen to the Immortals lanes now? We know that they have winning matchups almost across the board, and their blue buff Reliant jungler just got denied the yep. first blue buff of the game. Well, you look at it, this matchup here is something Huni can work on from game one to game two, already trying to put more pressure onto Impact. But like you guys were saying, the teamwork early game, Jensen had the lane pushed up on Poe Belter. No way for him to help there. Medios and the team had that setup. Really great setup. Absolutely. Yeah. Four minutes now, 300 gold lead, just about for C9, but that's going to start to spread if this can become now a turret or a big fight. We saw last game, it was very even, and then a huge explosion of gold after the fight at 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, Poe Belter gets really low, and this isn't even level six here. Syndra has so much kill pressure and so much damage, but big thing is Huni had already used his teleport to get back to top lane because he has so much pressure on that lane, and Impact played it perfectly with mm -hmm. the wave building up, chunking him out and making sure that he had to use it or else he misses a ton of experience. Yeah, and this also means that that if Immortals do try to gank the bottom side, Impact's going to have the teleport advantage. Uh, he, so just, he just used not to get back, too. To he could have had the teleport advantage. Yeah, <laughs> they're playing Impact, for the lanes. Come on, <laughs> They're playing for the lanes. There. <laughs> yeah, that just does seem to be the way that they want to go, though, is play through the lane, try to get an advantage there. You were talking about it in the draft, where they have drafted winning lanes for all, all across the board yeah. for Cloud9. Mm -hmm. So far, keeping the CS lead in the bot even across pretty much everything else, except for Medios out farming Rainover right now as he's kind of scrambling for camps, making sure Medios isn't coming in once again. They're actually yeah. right next to each other, and Medios will be sneaking a peek. He's got a level advantage on him right now. Rainover would <gasps> need something crazy to get What is this, this timing? He yeah. snuck up on this. If they can wait for Pobelt to the recall as well, they could maybe even kill him. Oh, he's going to try to smite it away. Oh, neither of them, doesn't have either it. One of yeah, them has they don't smite. have it. So what are you doing here, Medios? Make your mind. <laughs> he's putting pressure on a pole belter. Oh, Whoa! Wait a minute! This was planned out forever! Oh. Why, why did pole belter stay? Exhaust is down as well, so they can do a repeat. He only has flash there, and he's not even six. Immortals never knew Medios was there. Medios was thinking about the mid lane the whole time. He didn't care about rain over. The real prize was in the mid lane. Pole belter doesn't even get to flash. And he pushed Rainover off to the right side, and it looked like Poe Belter was still just hanging around, sees the Gragas come up at that point. <laughs> and oh man, because the barrel was thrown at the wolf camp, they should have been alerted then that Poe Belter does have to leave. Right, those are the few moments you have to say, I'm gonna be able to flash out of this, but maybe they just didn't expect Meteos to go level five under the yeah. turret. Poe yeah. Belter had to abandon right there. Yeah. Doesn't flash in time, gets chain stunned, easy kill with the Thunderlords, and his exhaust is down. That's killer. And this is uh, pre-turret changes as well, because on the live patch, the turret will acquire you even if the target is outside of its range. Right. You are in its range. So they were able to make it out nice and clean. Bot lane still getting pushed in. Impact trying to make just that here in the top side as he sweeps Goonie out. No worries. They're cleaning waves very nicely on that top side. I can't wait to see what they both bring to the table now that they are level six. They want to dive turtle. Yes, and Adrian's, Adrian's coming back. It's almost looking even more nice to dive in there. Maybe he's adding the bait. Thick skin and the chomper up. Devour, I should say. Hooney, parallel convergence falls behind him. He'll be able to just get out of this one as he farms it out. As a jungler, you could visit pretty much any lane on Immortals and have a good time. And Pressure on the bottom side, maybe you'll be able to get that turret. Top side, you're chunking him out constantly. It's gonna have to alt backwards. And in the mid lane, you already got the exhaust down and you have a Syndra. Yeah. Things are looking pretty good for C9. Yes. Uh, so far. What? Uh, returns to the scene of the crime. He's got a ward inside. Can't quite steal. He's just helping him out now. You do not want to help me to the creep <laughs> That's Rainover's been worrisome. keeping up on farm, even though he's getting pushed around. Like we said, can't really be helping his lanes right now as he's trying to keep up, understands Medios is creating that pressure, and he's got to almost replicate it. Yeah, and I also do want to point out that like the Nidalee versus Gragas matchup is not an, an even matchup CS-wise. When you see a Gragas that's equal CS to the Nidalee, that means the Gragas is dominating. Mm, yeah. Like, if Nidalee, you pick Nidalee to be 15 to 20 CS up on the enemy jungler, and that just hasn't happened this game, thanks to Blue Denial and thanks to the ganks. Yeah, and you think about what this is actually buying them. It's buying Nidalee not ending up doing scuttle crabs and having control of those parts. But hold on Tricky. here. Keep him slowed. Body block. 
Continue. Yeah, just a lot of trade. <laughs> yeah, you don't get scuttle crab control from the Nidalee, and the Nidalee is forced onto her side of the jungle, where you look at C9's jungle, there are no wards anywhere in their jungle, and Meteos constantly smites his own wolves to make sure that nobody is coming in on that top side. He's just trying to keep track of Rainover, whether he's the one walking into him and saying, here's Rainover, or having uh, the spirit kind of warn everybody else that he's there. He's just doing a really good job of keeping track of everything because all you have to do when your lanes are winning is make sure the jungler can't upset them from the enemy team. Yeah, well, we do see Immortals moving towards Drake right here, and this could actually be a decent sized fight. Like this, to me, is a little bit greedy for Immortals. Gragas isn't there. They're timing this with the blue handoff, but they are a little bit behind, and C9 might try and collapse here. 1100. No, That's huge. going to be hitting up that dragon. Medios is out. Immortals don't even get a chance. Yeah, Medios wasn't even, wasn't even close. If they had actually just kept on it, and maybe Povelter was a little bit in a better position there, but he can't. There's just so much kill pressure on him. It's such a loss of pressure to attempt Dragon like that, and then to be pushed off without the enemy jungler even showing. Yeah. Just will keep Medios ahead of Rainover in pace. And you even just look at the bottom lane CS, Wild Turtle on this Jin is being bullied out with the Tom Kench, which is such a high priority pick for both. But the Karma went through, and Smoothie's applying pressure alongside Sneaky in this winning matchup. And this is not the type of decision making we saw from Immortals in the regular season. Immortals had zero hesitation and always followed through right. on their plays. This was an example of if they would have had the confidence from the regular season, they actually just get the cloud oh, yeah, break you, and walk away. TP, right? They, they could have even TP'd in, exactly. There used to be a meme like, put a ward down at level two and who's going <laughs> to TP to it? There were so many opportunities to try something in that play and they actually back off. So if anyone is scared, it's actually Immortals right now. There is a lot of pressure on them though. You think about what comes with being such a dominant team and then falling short two times in a row and now having your back up against the wall against a team that already beat you to see if you even qualify for a top three team for North America. The yeah. Mortals have been thinking about this for a very long time. This has been their goal. Practice for Immortals as well recently. Wasn't the same for Cloud9. Cloud9 was able to play through these matches, had a bit more stage, kind of warm up, if you will. Here we go, there's the teleport. Able to test some things. Let's see if they're tested here. Sneaky gets the mantra shield out and he gets That's killed right away. No chance there. And this is where Immortal starts to act on their own plays, not waiting for something from Cloud9. Yeah, and that was actually just a really smart play and a poor play by C9. Meteos and Jensen both showed top side both clearing a pink ward you do not need to invest both people on that pink ward so as soon as they saw that sneaky and smoothie were in gank range everyone piles down bottom lane they get the kills and probably the turret oh turning it yeah. around here comes the tp on the bottom side and here comes jensen from the top at most it's a 4v3 oh, though Nars wearing off here they might just be able to turn on nope. impact he gets the ultimate off right before he goes mini they're into adrian thick skins used jensen trying to keep alive he's got rain over in turret range and that's gonna push him off impact will finally go down here as they trade one for one but you got to remember c9 just lost two they still save the turret though that's the big thing for cloud9 is they keep themselves with a little bit of a gold lead and those advantages stay intact instead of the game snowballing away from them yeah, still an incredibly bold call by C9. Like, when Impact teleports in there, the best situation is they have three against four of Immortals, even though Immortals doesn't hold their ultimates, and it almost goes completely wrong. Jensen got out of that fight with a pretty low amount of health. But like Zyrene said, they keep the turret, and even though they made that poor play in the bottom lane, keeping Sneaky and Smoothie out, they're able to salvage it with this one for one. Yeah, I think Rainover misses all the spears he ends up throwing during this fight here. Uh, and it just seems like there's a lot of pressure on him. The first one is dodged out. Then this one comes through and beautiful from Impact. Doesn't get the wall of follow-up. He really wants that though. And then next spear from Rainover ends up missing as well. Yeah. And then he has to get out of there. He doesn't get a hunted target there to try and blow up. But luckily they're able to turn it around onto Impact with a good deadly flourish from Wild Turtle to get the root. Or sorry, the Poe Belter Ultimate Chain of Corruption mm -hmm. is what landed. A lot of long-range CC from these 80 carries. And well, that's what we, exactly what we said Immortals needed to do in their poke composition. It started to get this little lead. That timer is on them to continue to stay even and even a little bit ahead of their opponent's Cloud9 in this game. Right now down 2K, but still looking like they can put up a fight as Cloud9 grabs that Cloud Drake. And Immortals actually had like a very ideal skirmish for this bottom lane where you saw they traded a little bit, Wild Turtle backed up, used the curtain call, then Adrian had the Abyssal Voyage and delivered somebody 
into that front line. So Wild Turtle is slowing the target. The Abyssal Voyage is right on top of them. You really can't get away from an Italy at that point. And the TP on top of it was kind of a little extra, but still, that's what you want to do is have Wild Turtle as the firing squad that starts the fight, and then you have Adrian deliver somebody right in. See what Rainover can start to do for himself. He's been pushed back into really his own jungle. It's the first time we've seen him kind of encroaching on Meteos. Doesn't look like he'll find too much, but the vision will give him enough to start acting on things. Sweep out for Meteos, and it looks like they are going to just pass each other without any fight. Yeah, Rainover finally a full level up. Mm -hmm. Check the experience, so the whole level up now, and then Italy just slingshots back. So that early game, a little bit over it now with that one kill and two assists to his name. But also, the Merc treads on Italy to make sure he doesn't get completely CC'd to death by Cloud9, because they have a lot. 32 on that call for Sneaky. He already has his Yomu's finished, so he's gonna get a little bit more rich. And a 77 on Wild Turtle though, and he's already 40 CS down. I picked that up pretty late. A lot of big lane discrepancies mm -hmm. as well. Not just Wild Turtle, but Pearl Belt are down a bunch to Jensen. Blue buff is basically property of C9 now. Oh, we also forgot to mention it's the first turret that went down for Cloud9 on the bottom side of the map after a push. Yeah, that all stems from them being able to defend that turret earlier and also having priority in that lane for the majority of the early game. And now they get wards in Rainover's jungle, yeah. which is kind of limit his ability to power farm. So yeah. the early game advantage you'd hope to get from Nidalee, he is levels above, uh, above Amidio, so to his credit, he's kept his experience up. He's got to make his impact felt now, though. Well, that's a good spot. Ooh, that was really good. And you can see he's the same level as the mid laner here. So rain over yep. on that Nidalee, just farming up two levels up, nine to 11. Cloud9 trying to do a little bit of work there. Meteos threw his pink ward in. You can see three more for C9 here. The confidence is building for those pink wards to be moved up and the confidence of being able to protect them as well. Pushing back a bit as Immortals get a little free time during Jensen's back here. It calls Sneaky and Smoothie up towards the mid lane as they continue a 40 CS lead over the bot lane. On you know, the laning phase is attempting to be moved away from for immortals. They're trying to set up seed. This is what you want to do with Varus Nidalee Jin. You just want to poke. C9 doesn't actually have sustain, so they can't get trapped in seed situations, even with a 2000 gold lead. If immortals tries to group up, C9 needs to fight. Immortals pinging behind them. They're saying known wards are here. Look for a teleport that is up for impact. They're being very conscious of what can happen around them here. They can easily be pinched in. It looks like they'll go bot lane for a sure for, for sure fire on that turret. Yeah, they already got it pretty low. They're mm -hmm. just trying to finish the job, but Impact looks like he wants to finish the job. Oh! Cooney had ulted back to lane. The Frozen Mallet had been completed. That is Nars' strongest time in lane. And that's solo kill number, I don't know, 100 <laughs> of the Rack playoffs up. for Impact. It seems to happen every series. Honestly, absolutely incredible performance. This NAR is something that, you know, maybe it has to be banned away from Impact because it's just such a powerful champion in his hands and it has so many different play styles. He can play at the tank, he can play at lane dominant, but look here, caught out bottom. Very surprised Meteos didn't actually decide to ult back Adrian and Turtle because he would have gotten two for one even though he doesn't do the damage to Turtle and they actually allow uh, Immortals to get away from that one. Depending on that time for Dragon, maybe look to keep the alts up or actually Fire down this mid lane. Looks like a little bit of a wave there for him, and they are gonna sweep it out. Rush pole belter. Oh, sneeze on it. <laughs> That's why. They did it. And they get an ultimate that was kind of randomly used. Yeah, they're yeah. getting a lot here. Like Pony's flash and still dying. His teleport to get back to lane. Yep, just now. And just making sure that that ultimate from pole belter is just another thing on top, where it looks like a little bit of a mistake or something that was forced from immortal. And every little chip like that makes it more difficult for mortals to pull something back because if they consistently burn these key cooldowns, they can never have a comeback fight from 100%. Right. Yeah, you think about yesterday when Impact was dueling Seraph over and over again and he would use the slicing Maelstrom in those fights. The very next fight didn't have it. It could have been one that turned it around. And so you're thinking, okay, is that flash going to mean something in a minute? Is that TP? Because it's an unanswerable yeah. play on the table for Impact. Yeah, and that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about lane pressure or being under pressure when you're getting pushed in by the other team because you're constantly having other things that stop you from doing what you want to do. 
Like a lot of League of Legends is about setting up the next aggressive play and executing the next play, and then you kind of build on your advantage. But if the other team is constantly making you burn these little things, you can never actually set up that play. And if you do set it up, you're unfortunately knowing you are behind and you don't it, have it's, your, your conditions get even more tight. You're like, this has to hit. Now we only have this CC. Yeah, whether you're it, really only giving yourself bad conditions. Yeah, whether it's a cooldown or a summoner spell or even a minion wave where, hey guys, I can't join you. I have a minion wave here that I have to farm or I get super yeah. far behind. And look at this collapsing uh, impact has Mega Nar. It's like C9 and Smoothie and Sneaky That's just pop out of nowhere. Poonie's gonna get locked down. Sneaky picks one up for himself as immortals scatter in all different directions. Pole belts are trying to clean up a bit in mid so they slow things down. That's gonna even out though and C9 may just put pressure on this second tier turret or ward up for that Baron pressure coming up in two minutes. Yeah, looks like Mountain Drake is their preferred mode of transport. Not a bad choice. poonie has got no teleport, everyone on Immortals is back, and they might even be able to accumulate top lane pressure while going for the Mountain Drake, so that's not gonna help Immortals one bit. Yep, that TP comes in handy for the pressure. You can't go and answer at that Drake at all, and especially with Poonie down. And C9 are just getting advantage after advantage right now. Mm -hmm. It's only a 2,000 gold lead, or a 1.5k, but still, they have ways to just blow this game wide open with the lanes that they've had, and they've been winning pretty handily here. And they're just playing really well. Yeah. Like, even in the first game when they didn't necessarily pick for super strong lanes, they still pecked for pretty good lanes, and they were winning their solo lanes by wide margins. Here, Jensen and Meteos were able to get a very early solo kill. Their one mistake, in my opinion, this game was Sneaky and Smoothie showing far up in the bottom lane while they had their mid laner and jungler right. clearing a pink board on the other side of the map. That was punished. But aside from that, Cloud9 has been consistently the aggressor, and they're stopping Immortals from setting up their siege at so many times. And here, Immortals is trying again. Let's see if C9 can stop him one more time. Impact hovering. His teleport's ready, so he says, I can create more pressure in the bot lane. I'll call you to that. Make sure Huni or Pole Belter will have to clean it up, but the pressure in mid from Immortals is going to obviously be faster. How does the fight happen though? There are two wards on the shoulders behind Immortal for Huni, or from sorry, Impact to teleport to if this were to happen. Yeah, it's a little difficult to siege as well because they have so much catch out too. If you end up eating a stun from from Syndra, you have to get eaten by Adrian, and also the cast backwards from Meteos was used. So now a little bit of a free reign here. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous actually that C9 was holding with three people while Sneaky was off in a side lane, but Immortals only gets a small chip yeah. of the turret. And now Immortals has got to be pretty careful because there's those three wards actually behind them. If they do decide to step up, that's range for impact to come in behind them. He just lost Maganaw, however, so it's not going to be an ideal teleport and this siege will continue. There's the activation. This means impact gets time to play in the bot lane by himself. You can see Cloud9 is How playing the yo-yo defense saying in and out, in and out, a bit of aggression filtered with a bit of defense and it's given impact a bit of alone time he'll back off though knowing he's going to start as you said creating that pressure now immortals has to act on it yeah and if impact keeps splitting like that there are opportunities with the tom kench to actually go cut him off with somebody yep. and try to create a two-on-one situation uh and that's why impact has to be a little bit more hesitant when he does that than what he normally would do Good. power in numbers along with the curtain call but it did not do as much as they had hoped. Also, no minion wave allows them to go pretty much past the turret or near it. I have to say, a pretty epic defense by C9 overall. Mortal spent a good Ooh. amount of time trying to siege down that turret and only got about 40% of its health during the three or four waves they were sieging. And that was when Cloud9 was holding with fewer numbers than Immortals was pushing in the mid lane. So that actually means that C9 gets an overall map pressure advantage off of that series of plays. Yeah, it's difficult to siege against a, uh, sorry, a Cinder that has been winning the lane, and you have 280 carries because everybody is just a really good target for her, yeah. including the Nidalee jungle that she can just blow up. If you get stunned, you are in a bad spot, and they're going to get this top turret off a great rotation now from a slow pushing minion wave. 3k coming in at 22 minutes. Not something you see these teams do uh, to other teams at top side of the the uh, bracket yeah. or even have done to themselves. And we're talking about how Cloud9 are playing so well. There's been a debate of who should go to Worlds. This is the game to settle that debate. And if yeah. Cloud9 are looking this convincing and they keep pressuring like this and they keep this up throughout the series, then they will silence that debate. And Cloud9 is definitely the third seed from North America if they're able to close it out. And it keeps looking like this. Consistent play is a very hard thing to keep up, and that's what's going to be the goal here in this. There's still more games for Immortals. 
And definitely a lot of experience behind that player, behind those players that they can bring out. And the poke composition this game, it looks like that will be ever so, or even more harder as the game goes on. And we saw just there, Ghostblade gets used early. It draws the ultimate out from Pearl Belter. Diminishes the threat from Immortal Siege for a little bit. But they're in this situation again where they'd have to hold in the mid lane. Impact is getting close to Meganar. The rest of C9 though isn't quite in range to get a fight. Well, Impact do. sees an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Jensen is so good at dodging skill shots. That is consistently one of his best skills. That could have been real trouble for Jensen. Those it's, skill shots could have landed. It even made Impact move up a little bit towards mm -hmm. the Turtle. And you can see that's that kind of what uh, tells you the lack of crowd control over there. Usually Syndra is picked for or, uh, picked for the lack of the reason that she can get out of crowd control. She doesn't have a lot of ways to leave the lane, but Jensen's up in the face of Immortals here saying, that's fine, I'll dodge your CC and he is not even worried about it. So you can see how confident they are in their play. 24 minutes. It looks like they're gonna keep this one going. They don't have to pressure anything. They feel like Immortals Ooh. right now will continue to do things that will give C9 the advantage. Again, they flash or no. It looks like the skirmishes are just starting right now. Huni getting a little bloodthirsty. It's been a while since there's been a kill. Yeah, and they've spent so long in the mid lane, but now they're kind of trying to just get the other waves going so they're not losing out on too much farm. The game has definitely become a little strange as Immortals has had these half committed sieges yeah. in the mid lane, but they've never actually had a Varus ultimate up at the time of a siege. So nothing has really happened, especially because C9 has been prioritizing the side waves and trying to hold with as few people as possible instead of trying to flank in for a big team fight. And the gold lead has just been rather stagnant ever since that top turret and gigantic wave coming in for impact and these CS advantages are still in the lanes for Cloud9. They've created a large advantage that this poke composition, uh, it's still struggling. There's enough damage from the from the Syndra to actually blow somebody up and you can't really get that close either because of Meteos and impact is now becoming a force to be reckoned with. And the question for Mortals also has to be who gets the farm. Because when yeah. you're doing extended Cetus like this, it's Pobelt and Wild Turtle. One of them is going to get naturally starved. Not too many wards on the map even, and Cloud9 able to realize the vision. Understand Immortals is not on the bottom side of the map. It's only Huni pushing, so the rest of the team would not be following. And the dragon will go over three drakes now for yeah. cloud nine. And when the drakes are going over, that should be your opportunity to siege and get a turret. Right. But immortals weren't able to push up. Jensen stays, clears out the minion wave, and then they can't brute force it down. And now they finally do. But does that mean a flank is coming? From a no, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Tells them to back off. Mininar. Kind of imposing, but Huni now invading the jungle. Yeah. Oh, he got it. Yeah, nice little steal by Huni. And Immortals has kept this game pretty close. Yes. Uh, even though C9 started with very dominant lanes. And I feel like this game is following a really interesting power curve. Because even though I do feel like poke compositions are on a bit of a timer, they're still powering up pretty substantially. Man Immune just got completed for Pole Belter. Wild Turtle still doesn't have Dusk Blade. There are still probably two or even three items that Immortals can still use to become even stronger at poking. And I feel like that happens up until even 40 minutes. Oh yeah. And since C9 is like lane dominant champions, they have a little bit of teamfight scaling, but like until Sneaky's at that max item Lucian, he's not gonna be a massive, massive teamfight threat. You know, Jensen still is gonna need one shot potential on people. And if there's magic resist with the Aegis being completed on Adrian, it's gonna take a little longer to get there. So I think both teams are actually fairly comfortable letting this game stretch a few more minutes. And it's still about who can make the bigger play. Yeah, and you're talking about the one shot potential there. You're gonna see some mods for both these AD carries. And hold on, oh. TP coming through, big fight. When you're getting pushed away from your own side of the jungle, Cloud9 routes Immortals. Adrian using thick skin, gonna go down in the end of this one. Huni in a 1v1 with impact as Rainover wants to join the party. Three's a crowd here as IMT now tries to bring in the resources. Rainover gets out very, very low, tries to get the heal, but still goes down as Huni's alive. Ooh. Impact finally goes down as well. Jensen trying to get the damage down, but he cannot finish it off himself. What a scattered fight. 
for all the sieging and all the strategy we had in this game beforehand, it <laughs> turns because there's a couple people that are where they shouldn't be in the top lane and C9 just sends everybody up there. And Meteos just chased Wild Turtle all the way down top, map, top side of the map. And Immortals, are they gonna continue to try and poke? This isn't a 50-50, it's gonna have to be straight damage. Meteos, Meteos is gonna be able to smite they through this one. Though. They could easily kill him on this, it's down to five, he gets the smite. And he gets out with his life as well. And Cloud9, when they see this window to take an advantage, they are not going to hesitate to take it right now. And think about this team when Spring Split started. It's like, where are the ba Baron calls? High's not on the team, where's the shot caller? Reaper has turned this team into a team that gels very well. They all know what they need to be doing. As some of them have said before, they've been headless chickens beforehand. <laughs> but now, this Cloud9 is a force to be reckoned with. I've said it already. Poor Wild Turtle. You can't do anything like that. You cannot run for Gracchus. <laughs> he was just way away from his team. Item spikes as well around the table for Cloud9. The Guardian Angel is there for Medios, picking up his own kills we just saw on Wild Turtle and putting a little bit more money in the bank. Again, Impact coming in with this build. Finally onto defense, but doesn't feel like it's the Guardian Angel this round. Going for the Randwoods. Yeah, the Randwoods is good. Since there's two physical damage poke champions, he's going to need to stack up his armor. Sneaky also going for what looks like a blood poster as his next item, which I think is pretty important for sustain and a little bit of poke immunity. C9 looking towards victory now that they've been able to grab that Baron. How well can they push these lanes? Immortals might struggle to keep these lanes at bay. Yeah, you think about their wave there, it's kind of a fall off damage cue from Pobelter, but he wants to use that to poke. If you're using it to clear these minion waves, you aren't using it for that purpose. And it's kind of difficult to actually kill those minions when they're Baron buffed up with that ability. Yeah. Piercing arrow is not going to be quite enough. And Pony's lucky that Impact doesn't have uh, Baron buff on him. Also, there'll be even more pressure in this top side, and the split push would be, honestly, uh, maybe resulting in a turret sooner. The gold lead staying at the same deficit, or I should say the gold itself staying at the same deficit for Immortals, but meaning less and less as we get into the game here. The composition for Immortals, however, getting much more dangerous into this late game, already getting pushed back to their turrets. Cloud9 is pretty much able to work the outer ring here on the second tier. Mooney's going to get a little bit of trouble for his time. Bot lane isn't going to be much of a fight, but it looks like Cloud9 can get pokes on these turrets and take them without a fight each yeah. time. They're going to keep going back and forth mm -hmm. between mid and bot. They can't clear these waves fast enough with a Baron buff, so they get the inside track on mid, and look at that. The ring around the Rosie is finally stopped. Immortals wants to play. Curtain Call pushes out Hooney. That's the ultimate, so he's looking for a target. He actually has the back line right in front of him, but the team can't engage. Turtle and Rain over getting pushed away. The flash body slam into Turtle and Rain over. The undecency for Medios. And Riv, they could get a bunch off of this fight. There's a cannon wave there. Another this wave is, is coming. It could actually be game. Yeah, 30 seconds on Pole Belter. The wave clear. Wild Turtle and Hooney will have to try and stall. They're going to go for broke. Wallop from Impact just missing the heels of Turtle. Looks like they are in the final Nexus turret. Another 30 minute game coming in. A lot quicker for Cloud9 taking it. The reigns from the beginning, they're gonna be on to the Nexus, and that is the ace for C9 as they close out game two versus Immortals. It's 2-0. And Cloud9, one game away from a complete shutout and a trip to Worlds. Yeah, insane progression from this C9 team throughout the year. You were talking, Zyrene, earlier in this game about how C9 didn't really seem like they knew how to close out games. They have closed out games incredibly fast against Immortals. Yeah, they were struggling finding a shot caller, finding a support, you know, finding something that would make the team come together. Apparently, it's that coach, Reaper, who's given them a whole lot of tools to succeed and honestly build a lot of synergy on that team. They're also picking a lot of CC, and they're willing to pull the trigger when necessary. That was a time where they were rotating back and forth very quickly. They saw a big opportunity in the mid lane. Immortals had another one of those half committed fights. Like you saw Hooney had the parallel convergence come in. Then he's like, nope, I'm going to alt out. And guess what? All the squishies are now in flash range for the Gragas. So they just instantly lose the game off of that one. Like Cloud9 is playing great, but Immortals definitely seem out of sorts. Yes. We'll see if they can pick it up as we go into a game three. But for now, a deeper dive on that Cloud9 victory. Let's check in with Dash and the analysts.
Thank you very much, gentlemen. Jap there talking about Cloud9's drafts and, and the tools that Reaper is providing his team that's, that's allowed them to get this 2-0 position over Immortals. And I do want to continue to hammer this draft because I know you guys have some I mean, serious thoughts about the amount of CC that Cloud9 drafted and then subsequently what Immortals opted into that CC with. If the tools that Cloud9 is getting is a power drill, what Immortals is getting is just one of those wooden hand drills because this is just- <laughs> They're operating a few centuries behind. Yes, yeah. this composition, what what are we doing here? This is a poke comp with triple poke, no tanks, no like, it's all over the place. It's too bad to actually even go into detail, but the thing that- <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there well it is. That's, the end, of the, yeah. that's <laughs> the end of our segment. We'll be back in three now. Yeah. <laughs> but once again, right, Cloud9 picking just two uh, double carry compositions with the tanks and doing, they're doing work. They know how to play it. They do really well with it. But the thing that I like the most culminates into a play at three minutes where even though Immortals, for, for some reason, early rotation their entire bot lane still gets completely counterpicked with the Carmelution and they lose lane. What Sneaky does, he goes in at three minutes, wards the blue buff, so that Cloud9 knows Rainover's route, Meteos takes that cue right away, steals the blue buff, and already Nidalee's early game is out the drain. Right, I think uh, when you just look at Immortals draft, this is like one of those drafts where it's like, let's play a poke comp, and then they pick everything that pokes as opposed to building a like all-around comp. Generally, when you build a pill comp, you don't just want poke, and you still want tanks, you still want disengage, CC, utility. They have like no defensive utility, but a Tom Kench eat, which is, Horrible. It's just too narrow, right? Because unless the poke, full poke works, then you're done, right? right. And you give flanks, yourself another any out. Any flanks, you're dead, anything like that. And, and you can, t like, even though we say tanks, there's different kinds of tanks. There's ones that dive, like an Echo. There's ones like Gnar who can do a little bit of both. There's Maokai who's great at peeling, you know? There's, right. And they, they took a diving tank instead of a peeling tank. So it doesn't even, like, make sense in that sense where you, like, it's not a great matchup either. It's just... It was such a mismatch of a draft. I, I really don't don't like it. Now, and that said, Cloud9 on your screens here, very much the opposite, building themselves plenty of tools to get through those mid games to create fights, but to disengage fights. We had a Gragas, right? He's good at both. We've got impact on that Nar, happy to play defensively or offensively and threaten that backline. So a much more well-rounded draft coming out of this Cloud9 squad. And then in terms of execution, you saw how comfortably they were operating throughout the game. They're okay with the slow moments, but they're also okay with speeding up the game. It, it seems like they're just very much, as Zyrene put it, equipped with the right tools. Yeah, and it's so nice to watch them take that game a little bit slower because they know they're getting the advantages in the laning phase. You don't need to look for anything, just farm it up. And as long as the lanes keep going that way, they're perfectly fine doing so. And they understand that the only way to stop the poke composition is going to be to have pressure on multiple lanes as well as making sure that they can defend the push onto the mid lane turret. And every time that Immortals tried to go for that push, they were there, they were answering. There was a lot of priority. Cloud9 took that first turret first, mm -hmm. the mid turret, enabling their mid lane pressure to be a lot better. It took so long for Cloud9, for Immortals to break the mid lane turret. And because they're going for the two man pressure with Nar on the top side or on the bottom side, he was able to amount like a 60 or something CS lead because Echo kept trying to group and he was unable to lane. Right, and I think that's the thing when you see a comp like the ones that Immortals has, is it, it is admittedly pretty hard to play against that in the mid game. They just keep grouping up and pushing waves in and, and poking you a little bit, but it just takes that one fight to break the game open, and we definitely saw that. We saw that very much so. 27 minutes into the game, a three for one for Cloud9, catching out the duo lane of Immortals here in the top side, gonna net them a Baron on the back end of it all. Yeah, you start running away from your base, you know it's not probably gonna be too fun of a fight. So we see that right away, Adrian's able to absorb a lot of damage, but there's just no follow-up to like, you know, put back on the C9 while he's taking that damage. Rainover gets stunned by impact as That's soon as he goes unlucky. over the wall. <laughs> yeah, and then they're, they're trying to get a little bit of damage in, but there's just, there's so much more HP and damage on the side of C9 that they just keep blowing them up. And then, of course, Turtle just finishes getting sold out by Meteos, and it leads into a very nice Baron because it happens right around that top side. And that's Baron plus another kill. And once that point happens, if you fall behind the, co the poke composition, oh, it's, you're, it's out the window. Well, right, exactly. So now I want to jump to the game ending fight, which is kind of showcasing how well rounded C9's composition is. With Baron, they have full permission to engage onto this poke composition with no fear. And they're trying to engage with the curtain call, which is the only tool they have to go in. But right away, you have Syndra that's able to flash in and deal so much damage, there's nobody from Immortals that can actually soak damage. That's the problem. With a poke comp, you need somebody to be a body so that they don't just dive past you and hit your carries. But there's nobody there, so anybody that they hit will die instantly. Tom Kent can't tank, Neely can't tank, so who's there to stand in front? Nobody, and that's why they died and lost the game. <laughs> yeah, Echo throws his W out, and you're like, all right, see ya, you just yeah. go past it. All right, so here we are, 2-0 in favor of Cloud9. Last time these teams met, 
two weeks ago, we had a 3-2 series. We went all five yep. games. So my question to you, as always, with the Mortals flipping back to the blue side here in game three, how do they begin that reverse sweep? How do they at least get themselves one game and extend it to four? We go back in the in the video right now and be like, watch the prediction 3-0, Cloud Mac. <laughs> I'm thinking there's no way they can do it. I think that that draft just all shows right. a complete lack of understanding for the development of the series on top of just no understanding for the current meta. And problems that Immortals has still had and still not solved. Yeah, I think uh, you have two choices. Get really, you know, nutty with your draft and try and get, like, insane picks. You know, who knows? That's mm -hmm. kind of a mortal style. Maybe they take away the Gnar. Try something. Don't... Riven. Riven's you coming. want Riven? I feel it. No, I, I don't want it. I just that's I'm <laughs> feeling. What you think want I feel like it. that's. None of us I feel want like it. when it comes down to that time, Hooney's sitting there saying like, "Give me the Riven. Let me let me do work." I feel like they need to at least swap up that top lane matchup. Don't play into the same matchup a third time. Well, I think the thing is, is like Hooney just always... can't. The the meta right now for top, there is all these. You have to completely clinch the top pool, and there. What else can you play right into the into the Riven? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I think Huni is the star of the team. He's opted into the NAR Echo matchup, which is admittedly slightly NAR favored. Um, and I think, you know, just get him out, try and, try and get him on a playmaker. Maybe he snowballs a game for you, something like that. I mean, what I'm getting here is that it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Either way, they're going to have to come up with something very, very serious or well, seriously different rather than what they're The more realistic approach, I'd say, would be try to tackle something that they've done before and not so, to kind of make a new meta right now, but just pick what worked for them in the past. You okay. have the, the full-on, the Soraka, the healers in the bottom lane, mm. and you have some CC from the jungle, some CC from mid lane, which was one of the things that we saw Pobelter do a lot. He plays Lissandra, he can play the Syndra, right? We see Huni Or Vladimir again. Or Vladimir again, and Huni has Lissandra. He does have characters that can play with a lot of CC, like the Nara as well. They're most likely to get blue side one more time, so going back to their old roots, particularly in the bot lane picks, will do better. Some kind of all-in comp, I think, is, is what it is. Just... You know, Lissandra, Vlad, you get the Nidalee too, why not? You know? Right. Yeah, well, we'll see if they can find themselves. We're headed to a break, but Cloud9 are just one win away from a trip to the World Championship. Stick around to see if they close it out or if Immortals will extend this series. We'll be right back. It's going to be a crazy one here coming into game two. We always wonder what will come out of picks and bans. So what are you doing here, Medios? Make your mind. <laughs> He's putting pressure on a pole belter. Oh, oh, wait a minute! This was planned out forever! Oh. Why, why did pole belter stay? Exhaust is down his... Curtain call pushes out Hooney. That's the ultimate, so he's looking for a target. He actually has the back line right in front of him, but the team can't engage. Turtle and oh, Rain over getting pushed away. The flash body slam into Turtle and Rain over. Ace for C9 as they close out game two versus Immortals.